Welcome to lecture number 90, historical topic 8.7, America as a world power. The theme is America and the world. The learning objective is explain the various military and diplomatic responses to international developments over time. The key concept starts with international developments in Latin America and how Latin America fit into this Cold War that the United States was engaged in. The key concept says, Cold War competition extended to Latin America where the United States supported non-communist regimes that had varying levels of commitment to democracy. Whenever the U.S. supported non-communist regimes, it didn't mean that they weren't always necessarily supporting democracies. Oftentimes, the U.S. supported dictators or military coups. In 1954, the Eisenhower administration approved the overthrow of the Guatemalan government because the Guatemalan president was threatening to nationalize some of the American companies operating in the country. Dwight Eisenhower and his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, were very active in working with the CIA in trying to influence the governments of other countries. They did this with the justification that they were protecting American interests in the region. This is very similar to the foreign policy of President Roosevelt earlier in the 20th century. The Roosevelt Corollary on the Monroe Doctrine asserted that the U.S. had the right to intervene in the affairs of Latin American countries in order to maintain stability and protect U.S. interests. In the case of Eisenhower, it meant that he'd even support leaders that were not democratically elected. Another example of an overthrow in Latin America is Cuba. Cuba underwent a communist revolution from 1953 to 1959, which resulted in a communist government led by Fidel Castro. It displaced a lot of Cubans who supported the old regime, which meant that some Cuban refugees in the U.S. hoped that the Castro regime would be challenged. In the context of the Cold War, the United States didn't want a communist country to be so close to the U.S. Therefore, the CIA planned to sponsor an overthrow of Castro by arming some of the Cuban opponents of Castro that were in the U.S., the operation takes the name the Bay of Pigs invasion after the landing location that the U.S. dropped off the opposition. Though it was planned during the Eisenhower administration, President Kennedy approved that invasion in his first year in office. It went terribly. The Cuban rebels that were supposed to go in and overthrow Fidel Castro were met immediately by the Cuban army. The plan failed within just a couple of hours, and the U.S. didn't risk sending in any more direct assistance for fear of starting a larger war. For his part, President Kennedy also engaged in a non-military foreign policy to advance U.S. interests. He created the Peace Corps as a peaceful way of building good rapport with other countries. The Peace Corps sends young American men and women to various countries to teach and do service projects, though their work may be overshadowed by the rest of the U.S. military interventions in the region. Lyndon Johnson sent troops to the Dominican Republic to stop a communist takeover. He supported a military coup in Brazil, and in an effort to protect U.S. American economic interests, he sent troops to the Panama Canal to make sure the U.S. maintained access and its rights to manage the canal. The bottom right picture shows the U.S. naval ship, the USS Missouri, going through the canal. It illustrates why it's so important to keep the canal open and for the United States to continue to have access to it. Had the U.S. not had the canal, it would have been impossible to fight World War II in the Pacific. The USS Missouri is actually the ship in which the surrender of Japan was signed. The next key concept says, Americans debated the merits of a large nuclear arsenal and the military-industrial complex. The nuclear arsenal of the United States grew in size and power since their use of atomic bombs on Japan in World War II. The H-bomb was developed by the United States, and it was nearly 1,000 times more destructive than the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those had an explosion power of 15 kilotons, while the first hydrogen bomb in 1952 measured 10,400 kilotons, and one tested just two years later reached 15,000 kilotons. The development of bigger, more destructive weapons was part of a larger containment policy outlined in the Long Telegram. In order to counter Soviet aggression, the U.S. had to have a way to deter Soviet military actions across the world. The next development in the nuclear buildup was the development of ballistic missiles to deliver nuclear warheads to the potential targets. When the Soviets launched the satellite Sputnik, the United States was very fearful because if the Soviets had the power to send something out in space, then that meant they also had the capacity to send a nuclear weapon to the United States before the U.S. could have a chance to intercept it. As both countries, the Soviet Union and the United States, continued to build their nuclear arsenal, they approached what's called mutually assured destruction. That means that if one country launches a nuclear attack to the other, then the country under attack would retaliate in kind. The destructiveness of these weapons guaranteed massive destruction and large numbers of casualties. The military-industrial complex was something that Eisenhower warned about in his farewell speech. He was referring to the growing spending on military equipment and the interwoven relationship between governments, the military, and the defense industry. The growing interconnectedness between these entities may lead to unnecessary defense spending, as the defense industry may try to encourage the buildup of arms even more during the Cold War. 
It's a little too convenient that Eisenhower warns that the U.S. could become a military state as he leaves the Oval Office. It's a lot harder to prevent the growing military-industrial complex when the U.S. foreign policy treated the Soviet Union and communism as an existential threat. The next key concept covers the countries that had not yet joined either the U.S. or Soviet alliance system. It says, post-war decolonization and the emergence of powerful nationalist movements in Africa and the Middle East led both sides in the Cold War to seek allies among new nations, many of which remain non-aligned. The term third world often gets misused in the way to describe a country that is less developed. In reality, its use originated as part of the Cold War and referred to countries that were not yet aligned with the United States or the Soviet Union. The map on the screen shows in green the countries who were non-aligned, their level of development was sometimes a factor for why they were not aligned, but there were also countries that were developed and had industrialized that were also third world countries. After World War II, there was a movement to decolonize African territories previously controlled by European countries. Territories in Africa were allowed to have self-determination so that fewer conflicts could arise between imperial powers in the future. However, when European imperial powers left, the various ethnic groups that had been grouped into the territory based on European-drawn borders fought over control of the new country's government. One of these examples is the country of Angola on the western coast of Africa. It's made up of a lot of different ethnic groups, and once the Portuguese left, these ethnic groups tried to come up with a government. The conflict erupted into a civil war and the United States backed a white minority government. The Soviet Union and Cuba were funding rebels to try and overthrow that government, and eventually the United States backed out and lost influence in the territory. The Middle East underwent a similar process of decolonization. Though Iran had maintained its independence through the imperialism period, they had their share of internal conflict and military coups. After World War II, Iran was ruled as a constitutional monarchy by the Pavlavi dynasty. In 1953, there was an attempted coup against Reza Shah Pavlavi, blamed on the Prime Minister, who was the leader of the Communist Two-Day Party. The U.S. and the United Kingdom reinstated the Shah and had the leader of the Communist Party arrested and tried for treason. A Shah-friendly Prime Minister was appointed in Parliament, and the Shah ruled as an autocratic dictator for another 26 years until 1979. Economic problems in the country increased dissent and protest against the Shah, and a lot of diverse groups worked together to call for the end of the Shah's power. Students, religious conservatives, and progressives wanted to end the monarchy and bring in a new leader. Their choice is the Ayatollah Khomeini, a Shiite cleric who had been exiled in Paris. The Shah was ousted, and he ended up taking refuge in the United States, where he also sought medical treatment because he was dying of cancer. Revolutionaries in Iran were angry that the Shah was given refuge in the U.S., so they attacked the U.S. embassy in the capital city, Tehran, and held Americans hostage for 444 days. The end of the Jimmy Carter presidency is marred by the Iran hostage crisis. There was an attempted rescue of the hostages, but things go wrong in the mission that caused it to fail. Carter then lost the 1980 election against Ronald Reagan, and finally, on the day of Reagan's inauguration, the hostages were released. This shows that Iran was trying to influence our domestic politics, as they felt the U.S. had done in Iran for the 20th century. There were more issues for the U.S. in the Middle East. In 1948, the United States backed the creation of Israel. It was carved out of a territory that was formerly held by Britain, but it was surrounded by Arab Muslim countries. They weren't happy that the state of Israel was created where there were other Arab Muslims already living, and a couple of wars were fought between 1948 and 1973. Arab countries were usually repelled by Israel with the help of the Western allies. In the Six-Day War, tensions were escalating between Israel and Egypt. Israel preemptively attacked the Egyptian Air Force, destroying most of its aircraft on the ground. Israel ended up with control of the Sinai Peninsula, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. In the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Israel's Arab neighbors, led by Egypt and Syria, launched a surprise attack on the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur. Israel eventually repels the attacks, and the war ends with a ceasefire that largely favored Israel. In this war, the ties between Israel and the U.S. came under scrutiny by the Arab countries and saw that the U.S. was an interventionist Western power. To punish the United States and their support for Israel, Arab countries used the resource that was plentiful in the Middle East against the U.S. Most of Israel's neighbors were part of OPEC, the oil-producing and exporting countries. They're able to influence the price of oil around the world by coming up to an agreement on the amount of oil to supply to the world. In 1973, OPEC agreed to limit the amount of supply of oil which led to a massive shortage of gasoline in the U.S. The price of oil and gas rise kicked off rising inflation. The growing cost of oil and gas hurts the U.S. economy which also created rising unemployment. These two things together created a new economic phenomenon in the U.S. that's named stagflation. <laughs> 
When Jimmy Carter was elected president in 1976, he approached the two sides, Egypt and Israel, and tried to bring stability to the region by opening up communication between the two countries. He invited the Egyptian president, Anwar Sadat, and Israel Prime Minister Menachem Begin to Camp David, the presidential vacation home. The agreement they signed in 1979 returned the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt, demilitarized the Israel-Egyptian border, and normalized diplomatic relations between the two countries. The non-aligned countries, referred to as Third World countries, were often non-aligned to avoid getting involved in the Cold War conflict. Some started an effort to create an alliance for themselves, in which they could come to each other's aid and stay out of that possible nuclear war. This is what happened at the 1961 Belgrade Conference, or the first conference of non-aligned countries. It was led by Yugoslavia, India, Egypt, Indonesia, and Ghana to establish a platform for cooperation and solidarity among newly independent nations. The United States continued to send economic and military aid to these non-aligned countries, a lot of the times without any strings attached to attempt to generate goodwill towards the West. They sent money to Egypt and India, and despite that, they remained unaligned. Sometimes, countries like Egypt towed a fine line in their non-alignment. They received money from the Soviet Union to construct the Aswan High Dam at the same time that they were getting aid from the U.S. Also, the Egyptian takeover of the Suez Canal in 1956 by President Gamal Abdel Nasser created an international crisis. The canal had been controlled by Britain and France even though it lay wholly within the Egyptian territory. French, British, and Israeli forces were fighting against Egyptian forces over the canal. UN peacekeepers were called in and the incident ended with Egyptian sovereignty and ownership. Finally, here's the recap. The Cold War extended to U.S. foreign policy in Latin America. There was a nuclear arms buildup and the growth of the military-industrial complex. The U.S. intervened in the Middle East to prevent the growth of the Soviet influence, and it ended with new sets of problems. And some countries continued to be non-aligned as the best strategy for themselves. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushslides.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back in the next lecture.